Deputy Speaker. I don't for one moment question the sincerity of those who have spoken against uh, my amendment. Uh, they have done so honestly, honestly and with integrity. And in a way, I respect their contributions more than those who chose to have nothing to say about this subject. Um, and I'll return to that in a moment. But just to pick up on Mr. Ig News, one of his latter points, uh, that you know, there have been many things wrong in the past. The point I was making is, that may be right, but why is it that we're being selective in the pardoning process? Why is it we're choosing only those uh, within the realm of sexual crimes who were homosexual in respect of obs uh, obsolete offences that they committed? Why is it indeed in the wider criminal calendar, and he referred to witches? We had the Ivan McGee witches. There's been no pardon for them, so to speak. Why are we being so selective in deciding, ah, we are going to push aside all the due process, we're going to rush forward with this single proposition relating to gay pardons, and everything else doesn't matter. Because that's the message that this House is sending out. There are multiple obsolete offences in every sphere of the criminal law, but only one recommends itself to this House for retrospective pardon. And that's the point I'm making. The selectivity of that is wrong. The discrimination of that is wrong. And I illustrated that in relation to many heterosexual offences now in respect of uh, matters that have become obsolete. Yes, certainly. Come back to my, my point previously. He says about heterosexual offences, but they, 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 they weren't by virtue of heterosexuality. This was discrimination against the whole homosexual community, and therein, therein lies the difference. There is no law that has, has been repealed that discriminates against the whole heterosexual community in this way. With respect, he's wrong. The member is wrong. The offences that I referred to were sex offences. Unlawful carnal knowledge with a 16-year-old. A significant criminal offence now obsolete, but committed by heterosexuals. Buggery, committed by a homosexual, to be chosen out specially for pardon. Why? Because, as I suggested, the fashionable fad of wanting to be on that bandwagon. And this House betrays its true intent by the fact it has glossed over and rushed past all those other offences in order to, to get to the point of offering these pardons. And that is the point about the principle of, not, uh, of uh, it being wrong to foolishly think that we can rewrite the law retrospectively, that we, the legislators of 2016, should take upon ourselves the burden of being the legislators of the 1950s or whenever. We have enough to do looking after 2016. And yet that is the purpose of this added amendment. I said I respected uh, those who disagreed with me, and I understand entirely the logic of their position. And I indicated I had more respect for them than those who have kept silent in this debate. Because we have not had a DUP speech in this debate. We had a speech by the chairman of the committee, but he did not at any point, as is normal, speak on behalf of his party. Why? Because his party does not want to have anything on the record about this matter. That is why the party of Save Ulster from Sodomy does not want to have it on the record that they said anything about this matter, and that's why they're so anxious there should be no vote in this House on this matter because of their own embarrassment, because of the fact 
They have those in their ranks who carried the placards, save Ulster from sodomy. And today, know that the action that this House is taking is validating that very thing by saying that it was wrong for that to have been an offence. That's the inescapable, the inescapable import of the retrospective pardon. It's this collective societal uh, contrition for the fact that that was ever an offence. And that, of course, embarrasses the party of, that is the DUP because they were so lined up with that particular campaign. And I'm disappointed that the instructions to their members are a three-line whip against this amendment. Of course, they're hoping it won't come to a vote. And they've been strangely, well, not so strangely, but totally silent on this issue. This is the party which told us properly during the Asher's case what a shameful assault it was on freedom of conscience. And yet, when it comes to this issue, their members are not allowed to have a conscience even though I know there are those on those benches who do not agree, they say, with this retrospective pardon. But they're not allowed a conscience on it. And I must say to the Ulster Unionists that I've often heard Mike Nesbitt uh, boast of the fact that his is a party that takes pride in having free votes on issues of conscience. Not today. Mr. Nesbitt, too, has members who are unhappy about this matter. So, where is the freedom of conscience? Yes, sir. Where is the freedom of conscience on that side of the House on this issue? Why is it being suppressed? Yes, sir. I think it's frankly close to outrageous of the member to suggest there has been any suppression of opinion within the Ulster Unionist Party. We debated this matter at length this morning, and we are treating it not as a moral issue, but as a legal one. End of. Not end of, because that, what that means is there's a party policy to vote against this amendment. And of course, both the Ulster Unionists and the DUP are hoping that there'll be no vote they don't want, some of them, the embarrassment of having to go through the no lobby on this amendment in favour of this retrospective gay pardon. So they're hoping that Alistair might shout out for his motion, but no one else will. That even if he gets a division, there'll be no teller. And then we can go around the country and pretend there was no vote. Oh, we didn't vote for that. That is the strategy that is being deployed, and particularly by the party that made it a central plank of saving Ulster from sodomy. Now I'm going to validate that very thing. And as I said in my opening remarks, within its ranks, many people who take a strong religious view, we're told, who are ruling elders in a church which still proclaims homosexuality as a sin, which still believes buggery is wrong. And yet today, those elders, like Mr. Story, Lord Morrow, Mr. Tom Buchanan, will sit in their hands and if it comes to put the party before principle. Now, Mr. Buchanan, just a couple of years ago, addressing school children, said, quoted in the local Ulster Herald, as saying, homosexuality isn't right, it's an abomination. Which Mr. Buchanan's here today? Where's he hiding? Where's Mr. Story hiding? Where's Lord Morrow hiding? And others who sat in pews yesterday 
in a church that still holds that homosexuality is a sin. That's the real challenge for those people. Are they going today to walk in their first ways, like Jehoshaphat, if you like? Are they going to follow the fashionable crowd? Are they going to take the hard road or the easy road? Are they going to do what's right or what's wrong? Very soon we'll know, Mr. Speaker. I call on the Minister of Justice to Claire Silgan to wind on the motion. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, I want to thank members for their contribution to this legislative consent motion. Specifically, I wish to put on record my sincere thanks to the Justice Committee for its report and the Executive Committee for its consideration of the issues at hand. Um, I entirely take on board the criticisms of the Justice Com Committee of my department in respect of the accountability around this particular legislative consent uh, motion. Um, I also want to put on record that I fully respect the role of the committee. I appreciate their scrutiny of this legislative vehicle and more generally of the department. Um, I'm also fully respectful of the, uh, of the role of the policing board and the police ombudsman. So yes, my department could have performed better in this respect, and for that I apologise. Um, and we will perform be better and be fully cognizant of the accountability mechanisms that exist in, in, in and around my department. In particular, um, I want to assure members that I am entirely mindful of the role of the policing board. Um, and uh, moving forward, my department is in no doubt of the role of the policing board either. I'm pleased, uh, Mr. Speaker, generally of the support um, that has been shown around this chamber in respect of the, the four elements of this legislative uh, consent motion, and I believe that it is sensible that these provisions be carried forward in the Westminster Bill. Um, I, I will refer to the, the amendment tabled by the, uh, Mr. Allister in, in, in his intent to do so, and he had outlined three reasons for, for putting uh, forward his amendment. The first of that was process. Um, and I suppose uh, Mr. Alistair accused me of not you know, consulting around this particular area. But I think uh, what uh, these late amendments to the, the, the Policing and Crime uh, Bill in Westminster has shown is that we need to take these opportunities where possible, Mr. Speaker. And indeed, we did consult around the process. And I want to put on record my sincere thanks to Mr. Alistair for his contribution to this particular debate. Because if anything, it has made me more mindful of seizing this particular type of opportunity and what we need to do. And that's righting the wrongs of this uh, of the past. Again, he refers to the principle around this, should, should we be um, uh, rewriting the statute book, as he put it, um, what should have been? Are we arrogant? No, Mr. Speaker, I don't think we are. I think that this is a case that this was always a wrong piece of legislation. And there is an opportunity through this legislative consent motion that we can right the wrong of the past. And I want to congratulate all those members who will support us in doing so. Because um, as Mr. Agnew has alluded to, this is a first step. And it's a first step, but I must stand here very, very deeply proud of as Justice Minister of Northern Ireland that we will support in this particular area. Discrimination, and again I want to thank Mr Alistair for bringing this to my attention because at the outset when it was revealed that we would move to, to table this uh, LCM to the, to the House and in particular this particular part of the LCM, Mr Alistair had raised concerns around um, uh, Northern Ireland's particular um, uh, difficulties around the Section seven, uh, 75 areas and indeed we, we, we listened and, and we took those on board and we are quite happy to proceed with this in, in terms of uh, that age of 17. And, you you know, I think only for, for Mr Alistair's intervention that we are able to proceed in that. So I want to thank Mr Alistair for, for enabling this legislative consent motion to go through in the way that it is going to go through, because it has strengthened um, what we can do moving forward. So thank you, Mr Alistair, for that. Um, Mr Speaker, I believe on this occasion that it is appropriate that these amendments will be made in the Westminster Bill. And I um, ask the House again that they will support the passing of this motion, and I thank all those in, who, who will do so. Thank you. Members, the question is that the amendment standing on the Marshall list be made. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. No. Aye. 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 Clear the lobbies. The question will be put in three minutes.
Order. Order. Members resume their seats. The question is that the amendment standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. No. Do we have tellers? Members, I am satisfied that Standing Order 27.4 provides that within a reasonable time, neither side has nominated two tellers. The question shall not be carried. The question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it.